And then it's my son Zane's double barrel. I gave it to him on his 16th birthday. It's a neat and simple Sears and Roebuck piece, but too light for a heavy gauge shotgun. Fixed too hard, sometimes digging its safety into your thumb. Zane hasn't used it in decades. And my dad's 270 Winchester with a scope so powerful that the first time Jed used it, he let a big forked horn stroll across the logging road and never missed a shot. I thought I was looking at the mountainside, but I thought I was looking at his rump. There was an ancient 22 single shot Remington. I can't remember where it came from. This isn't a hunting rifle. I don't think it's illegal to hunt any, anything with a 22. We keep it around mainly to put a suffering animal down, like our sweet old donkey who got tangled in a blackberry and broke both hips. I don't know where my World War I 303 Enfield is anymore. I think I loaned it to somebody. Never had much class, but it did have one of those old army issue flip up sights that you set by dialing it to the estimated distance. I killed a magnificent pronghorn over in the Steens with that sight. He was driving his herd across a dry lake bed at the foot of the mountain below us. I shot and waited. When I saw the puff of dust behind and below him, I adjusted the sight and fired again. The puffs got closer to close and closer until I was down to my last cartridge in my web belt. A big, slow, hollow point. I saw the dust puff at his shoulder and watched him go tumbling like a tumbleweed. He did three somersaults before I heard the slap of the slug. We paced it off at 530 paces. Best shot I ever made. But I never cared much for the rifle, maybe because the heft and the touch and the action of it all proclaimed in no uncertain terms, now this is a weapon. The worst shot I ever made was on an antlerless hunt in the Ochocos. The family all put in for the drawing, but Faye and I were the only tags drawn. I would have backed out, but we were fresh, married, and both in college, and we needed to meet. We crawled up out of our sleeping bags before dawn. We didn't start a fire. We sipped the thermos of coffee and nibbled butter horns while we trudged through the cold dust. The air was purple and rank, and the smell of high plains, with the smell of high plains sage. We weren't 15 minutes from camp when we saw a herd of a half dozen mule deer silhouetted along a ridge above us. Exactly what you might expect on an antlerless hunt. Five big bucks with incredible racks. Oh, and one petite doe. Oh, don't shoot her, Faye said. She's too small. For venison, she's just right. Way better than any of those tough old bucks would be. I was carrying the 270. I braced the gun along a lichen carpeted boulder, adjusted the high powered scope and squeezed off a shot. The doe was a good ways away. It seemed that it took 10 or 12 seconds before I saw the magnified image in the scope jerk into the air. She came back down running on three legs only. Through the scope, I could see that her right hind quarters was a shatter of bone and skin. Still attached to it was what was left of her leg. She never fell. She headed off after her galloping relatives, the ruin of her leg flapping in the dust. We found the trail of blood, but it petered out after a couple of miles. We never found the doe. I'm not going to do this anymore, Faye said. I knew I shouldn't have taken the shot. It's this damn scope. It makes them seem so close. I'm not going to do it anymore, ever. My infatuation was fading too. This was the last shot I ever fired at a deer. Every hunter knows the feeling. In the green hills of Africa, Papa Hemingway writes, you kill an animal until you don't want to kill it more than you do. Yeah, this has been a tough one on everybody involved, but Ben Walker's case was the toughest by a bunch. The 16-year-old had been shot in the back of the head and never regained consciousness. His eyes fixed and dilated, brain-dead coma, tubes down his throat. His family had to make a choice. If they unplug him, there's a dozen healthy parts that can be used for transplants. If they don't unplug him, he lingers on comatose, for those organs begin to awaken and weaken. They choose to unplug him. It's a choice our family can relate to. Here's my letter to the family, for Ben Walker's folks. My wife Faye and I had to make the same terrible choice some years ago up in Spokane. Jed and the U of O wrestling team went over a cliff on their way to a meet in Washington State. After we had been in the hospital two days and nights, we were informed that Jed was brain dead. We needed to sign a release so they could harvest his organs. Xeroxed forms were spread out 
on a cold okay. Formica countertop for our signatures. It was the hardest thing I ever did. Nothing before that moment and nothing imagined after could be that hard. It was midnight and dirty snow was swirling in the parking lot. Along with all of us wrestling families, there were other couples who had journeyed to the hospital to offer their support. They'd all experienced the same agony and signed the same similar releases. Their silent embraces gave us solace that even made our immediate families couldn't quite match. They understood. We were all members in a very elite order and none of us had ever wanted to join it. A nurse told us later that they used 12 things out of Jed, just like out of Ben, an even dozen. When the, hammer, when the number was announced over TV yesterday, it drove into my heart like an icicle, sharp and cold and hard, hard, hard. Please accept this meager letter as faith and embrace from Faye and I, and pray believe us when we say that we understand. The heart goes on, but it never completely heals with love, Ken and Fakeezy. Mending fence. It's been nearly a week now, and the phenomenon shows no sign of slackening. The cyclone fence that separates the school from the street is completely filled with flowers and messages. All the big network rigs remain parked along this curb, all their dishes raised and tilted toward an unseen satellite that look like vast white sunflowers. The grass curb and fence is a long time gone, gone, and a nice covering of clean pine shavings covers the mud. Cars creep past, slow and quiet, like relatives creeping past an open coffin. Busloads of kids arrive from schools up and down the valley, bringing new additions to the fence, poems and prayers, black balloons that look like clusters of grapes, poster boards, sorrow adorned with great school handprints, pom-poms, flags, Indian drums, drum circles pounding away in a haze of sweetgrass smoke, and flowers, so many flowers. In its way, the mending fence is a bigger deal than the heap of flowers. Princess Diet, the, the heap of flowers, Princess Di attracted. For one thing, this tragedy isn't worldwide, it's American. And there is more on the line. The mother of all gun battles is brewing, and this fence is drawn in the mud. So far, a commendable truce has been observed by both sides, a courtesy, a decorum, but this is about over, and the fur is going to fly. From the right, you can already hear the NRA rolling out their big guns and girding their big lobby loins, and from the bleeding heart liberal left comes the sound of much nose blowing. It's going to get messy. Trying to take the gun, nuts, guns away is going to be like trying to take a bloody pacifier out of the jaws of a Doberman with rabies. Trying to take the Kleenex away from the liberals is going to be just about as messy. So let's consider Kate's solution. I want to keep my dad's long-barreled 12 gauge. I don't mind, but I don't mind turning in the old ammo. I've got shelves and drawers and boxes that should have been thrown out years ago. The casings swell with moisture and stick in the breech. The Remington single shot and a couple of 22 longs is all I need around the farm but maybe a few birdshot cartridges to scare the occasional coyote away. Yeah, this has been tough on everybody. <laughs> Where's the rest of the pages? <laughs> Great God. Did I lose them over there? Oh, that's a new one on me. <laughs> anyway, what I got, got most from that is that uh, at the end of it, <laughs> thank you. There go uh, Okay, at the end of it. <laughs> I end up talking about uh, what is happening in Waco and Ruby Ridge and all of these places where people are going to vent their anger against somebody that's against them. And I appeal to the graduating kids to stop it. 
to go out there, look them in the eye, and take the gun softly away and say, hey, let's stop this. Because it's been going on, it's getting worse, and it's going to continue unless somebody stops it. And it's going to have to be the kids. The kids are the ones that are getting the worst hurt. It's going to have to be the kids that bring it to a close. Thank you.